This is not a normal Nuzlocke video. It's not a story of a glorious victory earned after months of struggling. This video is a story of an unforgiving Pokemon mod. A story of despair and failure. A story of Pokemon brutally dying one by one. Most importantly, this is the story of a Nuzlocke attempt that made me rethink the very reasons I do Pokemon challenge runs in the first place. But I'm getting ahead of myself. My first video about Pokemon Run and Bun was all about how badly I was destroying this so-called impossible hack. I just made it through the hardest fights of the entire early game, and throughout the run had just accrued four deaths. The opposing trainers in Run and Bun are difficult right off the bat. They have deep teams full of diverse types and unique strategies that take advantage of synergy between teammates, abilities, held items, or even all three at the same time. And I was destroying them. I didn't take a single death until the second boss. I lost two more on the first gym leader, Brawly. These gym leaders are insane, all featuring a legendary Pokemon, and pretty soon they'll all feature a mega evolution as well. By the time the last video finished, I'd gotten through two more boss fights. Roxanne's Ridiculous Rock Gym, which had a Zygarde and a Bisharp, and Trainer Shell, a pseudo-rival fight with insanely bulky threats that will test your team's endurance. On the way to Roxanne, my team really developed into something special. Togedemaru was the absolute GOAT encounter. Arceus himself could not craft a better pivot. As the Pikachu clone of the Alola region, it has pretty underwhelming stats, 435 total, tied with a bunch of forgettable mons. Togedemaru, though, is the perfect example of why stats are not everything. Ability, moveset, typing, team synergy, Togedemaru brings it all to the table. Fake out and iron barbs alone make it a patient player's dream, allowing consistent free damage and safe switches all at the same time. Get in, get a little bit of damage, get out, repeat. It got me through Chell, and it keeps working as I progress towards Watson's gym. And it has some incredible teammates. Intimidate users make for a perfect pair with Togedemaru's pivoting. First, Masquerade, a flying Intimidate user that can safely switch into the many, many ground and fighting moves Togedemaru will bait. Masquerade is the kind of Pokemon that needs the right teammate to thrive. Bug flying as a type has doomed many Pokemon to obscurity, but those teammates are right here. The second Intimidate Pokemon is Crocodile, with a big time attack and speed stat to take advantage of amazing attacks like Earthquake and Knock Off. Almost all of its weaknesses are covered by Masquerade and Togedemaru. These three Pokemon form a perfect core going forward and have me feeling invincible going into the fight for my third gym badge. Not only does Watson have another legendary in Zeraora, he also features the first mega opponent of the game, a Mega Ampharos. But despite all that, the scariest part of this fight is the lead Magnezone. The Sturdy and Custap Berry combination is terrifying. Sturdy prevents one of KOs, and eating a Custap Berry allows Pokemon to swing first on the next turn. This would be scary enough if Magnezone was going to click an attack like Discharge, but it knows Explosion. If it's Magnezone, boom, we just lose. Lead Togedemaru is able to break the Sturdy with Fake Out, but can't KO. I have to pray that Watson discharges instead of explodes, but I knew this old man didn't have it in him to play so recklessly. With the Magnezone out of the way, the Crocodile Masquerade Togedemaru trio is able to show its strength. Watson's Zero Aura always wants to either Grass Knot or Close Combat into Crocodile. It always wants to Close Combat into Togedemaru, and it always wants to use Plasma Fists into Masquerade. The trio always has a safe switch in, all while stacking up drops onto the Zero Aura throughout the Intimidates. Alright! Outmaneuvered, and we've barely taken damage! Two Pokémon down. Electros suffers from a similar fate. The drain punches it wants to use against Togedemaru are completely eaten by Masquerade, and then Executor can switch safely into the Thunder Punch. Watson's Lantern's Thunder Wave throws a wrench into the plan, and I'm forced to sacrifice Roselia after an unfortunate Magical Leaf roll leaves Watson's Lantern on 1 HP. But it was always the most expendable Pokemon in this fight. It doesn't have Technician after all, and I knew going in that most of the safe lines involved it dying. After all, I have other grass types to rely on, like Executor. Now it's on to the Ampharos, which is handled easily easily by Crocodile. Togedemaru neutralizes Rotom Fan with Eerie Impulse, and it's all over from there. Lantern mashes Discharge until it goes down, and I've got my third gym badge. Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. I want to tell you guys a quick story. I just, as I'm recording this, literally just came back from a trip to Japan for Pokemon Worlds. It was great. And I went there with my girlfriend. We stayed in Yokohama, but explored Tokyo a little bit. And we went through specifically the Shibuya main station, because we obviously traveled everywhere with the subway, because we're Europeans, so we're used to public transport. And because I'm a horrible, uncultured person whose only relation to this country is anime, when we went through Shibuya station, I was like, isn't this exactly where in Death Note, Kira kills Ray Penber. Spoiler alert, sorry. My girlfriend was like, I'm not sure, is it? And we like looked at the train and like looked at the station 
And I was like, I swear this is where this happens. So we go back to the hotel and I'm like, no, I'm going to show you the episode. And I try to look up the episode and I can't find it anywhere. It's not on YouTube. It's not on Netflix. It's not on Crunchyroll. It's not on Amazon Prime. I cannot find the episode. And I don't know what streaming services Japanese people use to, 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 to watch anime. And I also am not going to pay for them. I'm already paying for like five streaming services back home. To the rescue comes today's sponsor, NordVPN. It's traveling season right now. And you might be traveling to different countries. And maybe you want to watch the TV shows or movies from back home. Maybe even YouTube videos that you watch are blocked in other countries. You can connect to 52 different countries seamlessly with NordVPN to make sure that that you get the experience that you get back home. Some websites even have different prices for different products if you're logging in from different geolocations. And especially hotels and airlines actually do this a lot. It's actually sometimes really worth it to go through different locations if you're buying hotels or flights. So NordVPN is really, really, really useful for that. So if this sounds useful or interesting to you, go grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash Pokemon challenges to get a huge discount off your two year NordVPN plan plus four extra months free. It's completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. If you don't like it, get your money back. Thank you so much for Nord for sponsoring this video. Let's get back into it. It's officially mid-game. Cue the Bastion OST. Things are looking strong as I head onto Cycling Road towards Norman, who has been shifted up from the 5th to the 4th gym leader in Run and Bun. Pretty much every strategy utilizes the Togedemaru pivot in some way. Fisherman Dale's team with a bunch of gem enhanced attacks include a normal gem double edge from Kingdra, Togedemaru eats it for breakfast. On the way south, we get to marvel in how cool the designs of some of the fights in this game are. So this trainer is really interesting. This Mian Chao just does a f ton of damage. It's really crazy. It's cool. In the back is a Ninjask with Choice Band and U-Turn, and then an Arena Trap Dug Trio and a Magnet Pull Magneton. And we want to like knock it Arena Trapped. We want to knock it Magnet Pulled. To do that, we have to set up a pretty specific scenario where Mian Chao dies and baits out Ninjask so that we can then get in a better position from there. Because the thing about Masquerade is Arena Trap doesn't work on flying types, right? And Magnet Pull doesn't work on non-steel types. So whatever comes in on Masquerade, we can manage and switch around. Um, speaking of which, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to go back to Masquerade, get the Intimidate on this, tank the U-turn that's throwing out, and then whatever comes out, it's going to be Duck Trio because it sees a Stone Edge kill. We can switch out of again. We're not Arena Trap because we're a flying type. This wants to go through Stone Edge, so we just go back to Breloom, and that's just going to bring out um, Ninjask again, so we can just repeat this play. Nice. Very clean. Really cool fight. A lot of the random trainers are just like random trainers that are whatever. Like every trainer has like some theme or some like thought put into it to make it interesting. It's really cool. It's not just the Togedemaru show to be clear. Triathlete Benjamin has a really scary Eradicate which can become even scarier thanks to his lead Pachirisu with dual screens and Nuzzle for support. Dreadnought is the Pokemon in this fight with Rock Tomb to drop speed and normal resistance to make sure Eradicate's guts boosted facades don't go too crazy. All of these fights have been child play compared to the next boss. The rival fight. God, this team is fucking absurd. <laughs> because I took Piplup, who is now dead, this rival has a Sceptile, and oh my god do I not want to fight this thing. It has the Unburden ability, and is running a White Herb that can activate when it throws off a Leaf Storm, not only nullifying the special attack drop, but enabling Unburden speed boost. It has Acrobatics to take further advantage of the item use, has Leaf Blade to hit hard if its special attack drops after a second Leaf Storm, and even has a secret weapon to deal with pesky poison types. Thanks to the lead Psychic Surge in Didi in this fight, Sceptile's nature power becomes a terrain boosted Psychic. But even if I can get past that, this team is nasty. It has multiple scary setup sweepers, potential screen support, a pursuit user, and most of all, incredible type coverage. Okay guys, I just need something that kills both Granbull and Kingdra. That should be really easy. Pangoro is taught Brick Break to ensure that Light Clay and Didi can't put me in a bad spot right away with its greens. I also have what I think is a pretty good plan to deal with the Sceptile. It can't use its White Herb to reset its special attack if I've already forced the White Herb to be used with an Intimidate. While I don't want to switch into a full power Leaf Storm, I can work out a plan against a half power one. Intimidate from Mastering will take off the White Herb before Leaf Storm. Let's hope you went for Leaf Storm. So we can get the special attack drop. If not, this is going to get a little bit more complicated. That is really awkward. <sighs> okay. 
that's a problem. Not only does the Masquerain take tons of damage, but now every switch is that much more dangerous thanks to Sceptile retaining its special attack. Now I'm in a situation where I have no choice but to accept at least one potential critical hit, if not two. I consider a line where I switch to Pangoro instead, but after some debate, I decide to let Togedemaru take one hit. He's gotten us through so much. I'm sure Routed Game can get us through this one as well. He just has to hold on. It's going for Leaf Storm. Leaf Storm crit only has two rolls that kill me. Let's attack. I mean... Wait, I... No, that... No... <clears throat> I, I guess this will just happen in in Nuzlocks when you when you play into crits. It's it, it's to be expected. This was actually just under one percent to kill because it was also a range, and the, this terrible combination of rolls puts me in an insanely tough position. Not just for this fight, but the rest of the run. And I think I really like Togedemaru. I'm at least able to salvage this fight. Pangoro gets the revenge kill on the Sceptile, and, and Ampharos can safely switch in on Halucha's acrobatics before taking it down. I'm perfectly prepared to have to make another sacrifice, but Pangoro somehow baits a solar beam and gets a free Brick Break KO onto Houndoom, giving me some huge momentum. But now, Kingdra. My answer? Whatever I have left. I switch to Cloister, hoping Kingdra clicks Liquidation, as it sees one killing roll against Pangoro. Well, good luck. The one thing I didn't want to see. Cloister chips away as much as it can with Icicle Spear. The Kingdra is low, but it can KO my entire team in one hit with the right move. I'm trying to find a line that gets me out without having to sacrifice three more Pokemon just to get through this fight. Cloister is the first to go, unavoidably. Masquerain is sacrificed as well to get an important Intimidate off, and I'm able to switch Ampharos into a Breaking Swipe safely, avoiding further disaster. Dreadnought comes in, hits a couple of Rock Slides, and I'm through. But the run took more damage here than in any other fight so far. None of the Pokemon I'd lost to this point were nearly as critical as Togedemaru or Masquerain. I'm not optimistic. All of this just had to happen right before the Norman fight too. Norman is designed to be a choke point of run and bun. This is one of those fights that Nuzlockers will spend the entire early game preparing for. Even if it seems like everything's going well, missing or losing just one or two optimal encounters can be enough to put a run in danger, just because of Norman. And as every experienced run and bun player in chat is letting me know, my best options for this fight, the gatekeeper of the mid game, are all in the death box. I'll be real with you. There was a time where I would have ended this run right then and there. If this wasn't literally attempt one, I would go straight back to starter selection here, no question. When all you're focused on is winning the whole run, it feels pointless to progress when you know full well you've lost tools you'll need to win. Why waste the time? Go back to the truck, start again, optimize the early game, and repeat until you win. After all, had I not sloppily lost Brinplub on Brawly, I would have had Empoleon as an answer to Kingdra. I'm not sure I have a good answer as to why I didn't reset. Something about Run and Bun has been uniquely compelling. The game is a love letter to the depth that Pokemon's ridiculously simple yet complex battle systems can offer. If there's a cool bit of synergy or a cheeky bullshit strategy you've always wanted to force on the Pokemon Showdown ladder, you can bet it's included here. And so... Despite the fact that this run is as over as a run can get before actually wiping, I press on forward. Suddenly, the run has changed. Death now looms on every corner. The trainers I saw as just cool and interestingly designed before are now actually terrifying. The Pokemon left in my box are less and less equipped to deal with their power. Now, resource management is everything. The limited berries of the game are at a premium. Encounters are few and far between. Run and Bun is out to get me, and I'm just trying to make it as far as I can before it finishes me off. I'm still limping from the rival fight, but it's out of the frying pan and straight into the fire. The next battle is a double featuring a nasty inner focus Kangaskhan. I decide to spend a rock smash encounter in the hopes of finding something that can help. It's a rock and roller. Fine enough to bring, but I, I don't see it rescuing this run. My lack of pivots is forcing me to get creative. I, I, I pre-damage Zatu in an attempt to bait sucker punches from the Kangaskhan to get some free switches. This battle will viciously punish the player for taking the wrong kill at the wrong time. If I use a water type to take down the Lycan Rock, the victory bell that switches in will rip through it with a leaf blade. If I kill the Kangaskhan with a fighting type, it'll be a sitting duck for Firo Drill Pick. 
but I also can't leave both of them on the field, as a double up can take out the Dreadnought I'm counting on in this fight. The pre-damaged Zatu feels like my best way out, but double battle AI is complicated, and I misread it, switch the Zatu into a Lycanroc, and the ninth death of the run is here. I'm able to get through the rest of the fight unscathed, but that's another flying type in the death box. Losing Zatu might not seem like a big deal, but each death from here on out hurts more than the last. This was my last earthquake immunity. After spending an hour taking on two of the easier fights on this route, I'm confronted with another insane double battle. Black Belt Rhett's monsters will all bash your head in. Hypercutter Crabrominable, Flame Orb Guts Heracross, and Belly Drum Polyrath. These are all slow, lumbering beasts, but that's where his partner, guitarist Marcos, comes in. Both his Crobat and Noivern are extremely fast and can set up Tailwind. That means if you don't have something that can shut down Crobat's Tailwind, Crabrominable will get to bludgeon you with a massive close combat or ice punch before you have a chance to move. Desperate times call for desperate measures. I decide this fight requires another rare candy. With another level up, Gigalith will be capable of taking a close combat from the crab, ensuring that it will instead target the other side of my field. To get through, I need Gigalith to get three hits off of Rock Blast, twice in a row. Rock Blast has a 35% chance to hit just twice, and each time it would have left me wide open to instant death from these monstrous opponents. But these are the situations Run and Bun is putting me in now. I have no choice but to play the odds and put my faith in perhaps the single most fickle god in video games, Pokemon's random number generator. Come on, Gigalith. For the boys! You're goaded. You're goaded! I kind of needed, um... Needed the pivot. Please hit three times. Come on, dude. You're actually goaded. After taking down Pokefan Miguel and his team of fake Pikachus, I get access to another encounter. I think this one's gonna save the run. Fuck. Hey, they can't all be hits, okay? There really were some chances for greatness here. This area is loaded with steel types that would have been incredible for Norman. Sandslash Alola, Magnezone, Lucario, and Conkeldur all would have been great matchups for his normal types. Porygon, Avalog, and Torkoal would have been wonderfully bulky options to absorb hits. This is all to say, literally every encounter except Nummel is good for Norman here. I actually make it through the next few fights without much issue. Aroma Lady Daisy has a scary Lurantis that can use two moves in tandem with its contrary ability to grow even more powerful, Super Power and Leaf Storm. Thankfully, Toxic Croak resists both and lives a facade on 3 HP. With that monster gone, her fake Monograss team is pretty easy to deal with. I steadily bleed out her Florges through Toxic, and Daisy goes down. Twins Amy and Liv are here to haunt your dreams and turn them into nightmares. Their team is built around sleep strategies, and their highest damaging moves are Hex and Dream Eater. Dark isn't exactly known as a great defensive type, but here, all the Dark types I've been collecting are my greatest asset. I take down Fisherman Andrew with Breloom and Houndoom, and I'm rewarded with a Lagging Tail, an item that makes the holder go last. Might not sound like the most useful item yet, but I know I'm going to need to dip into some weird strategies to deal with the horrors that await me. I'm finally ready to take on Norman and the Petalburg gym. My first opponent is cool trainer Mary in the accuracy room. She simply does not miss, bringing the four best no guard Pokemon in the game. Sorry, Carablast. Each Pokemon has one or more of those moves that would clearly be amazing if it weren't for inaccuracy. Dual Blade has Head Smash, Golurk and Machamp have Dynamic Punch, Lycanroc has Iron Tail, and the last three all have Stone Edge and Mega Kick. Masquerade's type and Intimidate would be the perfect weapon here. Instead, facing all these powerful moves with no easy way to weaken them, I'm pretty much resigned to having to sacrifice something. The punching bag in this fight is Gorbis, which I'm forced to give up to a Machamp Mega Kick unless I want to risk one of my more critical Pokemon. Given how scary bulk up boost a Machamp can get, it's what I have to do. These are the kinds of learning experiences that make me want to continue this run. Even from the perspective of simply playing to win, most runners that get a Clam Pearl just let it rot in their box all day. Even though it may not be an optimal encounter, I now know this gym is a place where I can find some value from it if I need to. It's on to the recovery room, with permanent grassy terrain provided by Rillaboom. All sorts of recovery moves, leftovers, and abilities like Natural Cure, Regenerator, and Magic Guard. One thing that's nice about this team is the presence of all these recovery moves means these Pokemon don't quite have the type coverage that a lot of other foes have had at this point. I'll have to take heavy advantage of that if I don't want to find myself in a drawn out war against all these bulky monsters. I even found a way to make Toxic work against Magic Guard Clefable. The Toxic Poison may not do double damage, but it boosts Venoshock to a super effective 130 base power, and that does pretty well here. One more challenge awaits me before Norman. 
the recoil room. Burke is willing some of Pokemon's strongest moves, moves so strong they had to be balanced by recoil damage. The last three Pokemon have Reckless, an ability that boosts the power of recoil moves by 20%. I'm risking death every time I let them swing. Thankfully, the Floet Eternal doesn't have anything besides Light of Ruin, so I get an easy start with Tentacruel. Lantern is able to safely pivot into the Lucario and get a Paralysis off, so Camerupt can take it down. I have a strategy to dispose of the Bufalant. I'll use Gigalus Bulldoze to whittle it down just before it can eat its Custap Berry, and then I'll finish it with a Rock Slide. It turns out the RNG had other plans. That is really bad that that happens. I don't know if the plan was great, but the critical on Gigalith left me with my back against the wall. I find myself in a situation where I have to consider risking Gigalith on a 4-hit Rock Blast. Risking it on a 30% chance feels wrong, but the alternative is worse. If I switch, the Bufalant would kill the Camerupt and activate its Custap Berry, thanks to the recoil damage it would do in the process. I'm also facing multiple unfavorable ranges to kill even if I do switch, so I decide to let Gigalith rock. But there's still an Embor, but you know what? Okay, let's just fucking send that shit because we're gonna hit four times here. Oh my god, that is the worst possible outcome! The run has officially spiraled completely out of my control. I'm able to use Crocodile to bait reversal and get Tentacruel in to finally put an end to the most RNG Bufalon of all time. Crocodile switches back into an Embor Wild Charge before finishing the fight. And that was the easy part. It's finally time to deal with the Sword of Damocles that has been hanging over this run ever since the rival fight. Ready to end it all, my father. This fight is going to decimate my team. There's no way around it. With Togedemaru and Masquerain, I may have been able to pull it off, but with this box, I have no choice but to go for a plan that is essentially just a sacrifice chain. I'm willing to let everything die but the Ampharos, which will be necessary to defeat the Mega Pidgeot at the end of the fight. I'm nine hours into the stream, I'm a dead man walking, but I'm determined to win at least one more fight. Let's do this. The fight starts calmly enough. Toxicroak uses its berry to get through a first thunder wave and gets big damage onto the Porygon to take it down after taking a second thunder wave. But I'm already having to take some risks by turn number three. I pass the first big RNG test of the fight. Toxicroak swings through the paralysis to hit a sucker punch onto Diggersby and break its focus sash. There's sacrifice one. Another berry nullifies a body slam paralysis on Executor and Diggersby drops. There's sacrifice two. So long, Eggy. But suddenly, a hitch in the plan. I forgot to hardscale Venishock back onto Tentacruel, and now I'm in a tough spot against the Azumarill. Without the most damaging poison move I had available, Tentacruel falls to an Aqua Jet, and now Norman has the chance to massacre my entire team. An opening presents itself. As Azumarill chooses not to Aqua Jet my Breloom on the next turn, I'm halfway through, but the worst is yet to come. Norman brings out Chinchino. There is one triple axle range that kills me. The rest, I can survive. If I can just dodge the one triple axle range, there's a shot I can get out of this alive. And he went Chinchino because there's like one roll of triple axle that kills. Get. That is insane. Wait, that is so fucking insane. <laughs> Thanks to the luckiest effect spore of my life, the entire dynamic of this fight has suddenly shifted. I, I not only have a way out, but I might be able to save a couple of my strongest Pokemon in the process. Mega Pidgeot comes out first and I go to Ampharos. It withstands a hurricane, paralyzes the Pidgeot with Thunder Wave, and unleashes one final discharge off before going down. I'm in better shape than I could have hoped for just a few turns ago, but I have to play this endgame correctly. I opt to let Breloom kill the Pidgeot so I can have it out for Norman's final Pokemon, Meloetta. This way, I can keep access to priority moves against her faster pirouette form. It all comes down to this. Does the Relic Song put me to sleep? I think we win. It doesn't. Brick Break into Mock Punch kills, and I'm walking out of Petalburg Gym with two more Pokemon than I expected to. I actually survived this entire fight without even bringing out Crocodile. Despite going in with minimal chances and losing four Pokemon after nine hours of streaming, this was one of the most fun fights I've had in a very long time. The RNG gods were shining down on me in this fight. The zombified corpse of run number one ambles onwards. Let's see 
how far I can drag it. I've reached the halfway point of the game now with the fourth badge, so it's fitting that the next split opens with a sort of budget Elite Four. I'll be taking on the Winstraight family. These four trainers have smaller teams than I'm used to, with two or three Pokemon each and ten total, but with no opportunities to heal or swap out my team in between fights. In true run and bun fashion, there is no weak Pokemon in this gauntlet, but one threat stands tallest above the rest. The Winstraight Matriarch is the last of the four to challenge you, and she opens with a Pokemon every run and bun runner learn to fear. This Mega Metacham with pure power is the ultimate destroyer of runs. It can hit 10 different types for super effective damage, but even neutral damage from this demon is going to be hard to take after going through the first three teams of this gauntlet. This is the reason why everybody who knows this game has been telling me that my run was doomed no matter what happened at Petalburg Gym. With my entire chat telling me to finally put this run out of its misery, I somehow see a way out. The first fight is simple enough, with merely a Tukanon and an Emolga. The next fight is a bit tougher, a nasty fire water grass team featuring a Bombasnow, Send a Scorch, and Seismitoad, but I can deal with that too. Flygon is the scariest thing on the next team. My primary goal for this fight is to position Octillery against it. I don't really have another answer, so I need to make sure I keep it safe from the rest of the monsters on these teams. I'm essentially limiting myself to a team of five until then. A Stun Spore miss from the Robombi gives the critical opening. Octillery gets on the field safely against Pseudo Wood but we're not out of the woods yet. Pseudo Wudo will soften up Octillery for an easy kill at the hands of Flygon if it's allowed to attack, but Octillery hits the range and it survives critical Dragon Claw before ending the fight with Ice Beam. And I'm finally on the last win straight. All this was just bullshit to make your team not optimal for what's coming up. Maybe your team can survive Mega Metacham High Jump Kick or Stab Earthquake in Pursuit from Moxie Crocodile, but most likely it won't be surviving any of that after enduring the gauntlet that was the rest of the Winstraight family. Even my healthiest Pokemon have taken some chip damage and I'm already forced to consider a sacrifice on the very first turn. I start my pivot chain with Mightyena, hoping the Metacham won't High Jump Kick or even better that it misses. No luck on either count, but at least I've managed to weaken the Metacham's attack by switching Crocodile for another Intimidate and force the high jump kick again. I pivot to Beedrill, the four times resist. It's okay. It's all right. I'd been avoiding these catastrophic critical hits for so long. It was only a matter of time until something like this happened, but this couldn't have come at a worse time. It looks like the nail in the coffin. Somehow, after more Intimidates, Dreadnaw is able to barely survive a high jump kick and strike down the Winstraight's ace. This was just one of many shining moments for Dreadnaw, but it came at a steep price. The damage it took left it dead to Crocodile's pursuit on the next turn with no recourse. Breloom and my own Crocodile are going to have to finish this themselves. Breloom dodges a final critical hit and the Grandma finally goes down. Look what the fuck Dexa has to bring to stop me. And what do I do? I stumble, and I get back up. Somehow, this run has made it past the wind straits. They say what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. My box at this point would like to disagree. There are now more Pokemon in the death box than the alive box, and I'm about to head into a barrage of trainers who will be fighting me in perpetual sandstorm. But somehow, I've made it past the fight everybody told me would be the end. There are even more vicious monsters ahead. As fun as it's been to silence the haters who said the run would die at the Machamp Trainer or to Norman or to the Winstraits, it's only a matter of time. Death awaits every single Pokemon on my team and in my box sooner rather than later. I march into the desert that I know will end this run and am, am I smiling? Why the hell am I smiling? Pretty much everything on this route can take advantage of the sand in some way. There are rock types who have their special defense boosted. Sand Rush and Sand Force abusers, Pokemon who ignore sand damage thanks to Overcoat, Magic Guard, or Safety Goggles, and finally, this combination of pure evil, Bright Powder, and Sand Veil, granting every attack used against its wielder a 28% chance to miss. Is this even worth my time if I know I can't win? On the second fight of the desert, I get to use one of the most devious strategies I've employed yet. I picked up the lagging tail all the way before the Norman fight, and now you'll see why I wanted it. Crustle has Shell Smash and Weak Armor. I lead Breloom, holding the lagging tail, ensuring Breloom will always go last in his priority bracket. If Crustle Shell Smashes, Breloom will go second and, and deal damage after the Shell Smash defense drops. That'll give me a chance to KO with Mach Punch priority, thanks to the combined defense drops from Shell Smash and Weak Armor, preventing a rampaging Crustle from running over my team. I'm still alive 
dodge somehow. The Crustle doesn't smash, so it's only sitting at minus one defense, but it, it, it it's fine. It didn't set up Shell Smash. I dodge the crit and it goes down. After some more maneuvering on the Pillow Swine, Miltang takes it down with Seismic Toss, and I'm on to the next fight. Whew. I mean, we did it. This is really not looking good. My god. Planning fights with seven Pokemon is much, much different than planning it with a full box. I'd spend most of the game evaluating which tools I needed to bring to each fight. Now that decision is made for me. This requires a different philosophy. How can I make the few tools I have fit the problem presented to me? But I'm starting to get acquainted with these teammates of mine as well. I have to lean on Pokemon like this dog shit camera up that ruined my Norman, it would otherwise be rotting in the box, but it's coming to every fight. It, it turns out to be the hero in the next double battle with enough power to take down the Gigalith and the Nidoking. It takes two kills and the rest of the fight is simple from there. The Houndoom I normally know as an extremely niche glass cannon Pokemon with a gimmicky typing starts pulling its weight. Finally, after a battle of hellish switching around a Torterra spreading leech seeds, I avoid a run ending double protect and Houndoom is able to kill. For my troubles, I've earned another encounter, and I've never been this excited for a new encounter. I mean, come on! I was hoping to avoid another ground type here, but Gliscor isn't your typical ground type. Gliscor's flying type adds two critically important traits to my team that it's been lacking. A ground immunity and a fighting resistance. Sir Glock has become my knight in shining armor. I take my refreshed team for the most difficult battle of the desert so far. I crush most of the team, but this Mandibuzz is giving me fits. It's almost dead and it's paralyzed, but it has Roost and a Rocky Helmet, so if I make one wrong move, this fight can still spiral out of control. I opt to leave Houndoom again. If the Mandibuzz protects, I'm in huge trouble. Let's fucking go, man! <laughs> again? Am I starting to like this Houndoom? And all that just got me partially through this desert. The first of the Sandvale Bright Powder Demons is here, a, a pallet of sand, and it immediately starts ruining my day as Breloom misses the seed bomb that could have killed it. I decide to risk Gliscor, switch in, and thankfully the pallet sand uses Scorching Sands. A fight that could have easily spiraled out of control is taken care of by the one and only Sir Glock who is carrying this bruised and battered team on his back now. Despite all this, I'm still a full route away from another encounter. I just keep scratching and clawing my way through these fights. The Breloom effect spore against Norman continues to pay off, and he's already secured a spot in my heart because of it. Ninja Boy Jinra has, among other things, another pair of Sandvale Bright Powder Pokemon, but I'm able to remove the inconsistency from this fight by teaching an Aerial Ace TM to Breloom. Magma Armor has been buffed in this game to prevent critical hits, so I'm able to use Camera Up to both endure some hits from Jinra's Charizard and to bait Focus Punch from the Cacturn, rendering it effectively useless against Gliscor. As I look into this Camera Up's dopey eyes and realize how often it has now saved this run, how I'm somehow building an emotional connection to these pixels on my computer screen, I asked myself, what happened to the thousands upon thousands of Pokemon that were deleted in the hundreds upon hundreds of attempts I carelessly reset over in previous Nuzlocke challenges? Pokemon whose save file was deleted without a second thought because the Pokemon I got were just not right or because I lost a Pokemon too early in the run. My team of heroes takes on five straight fights without a death, but Route 111's final team is terrifying. After going through the sand gauntlet, cool trainer Brooke throws a heal team at you, led by her Vanalux, but there is so much more to it, with three blizzard users, a weather ball magmortar, and a slush rush bear tick that can easily sweep you. Weather effects in this game are always permanent, so I can't just stall them out. My goal was to use Lantern to set myself up into a good position, but the tentacle makes sure I can't with an immediate crit and poison from a poison jab. Poison and Hail Chip combined to force me to make defensive switch after defensive switch. The barrage of passive damage slowly but surely stacks up onto practically my entire team. I end up forced to sacrifice Miltank, but again, I somehow find one way to win. I need to sacrifice Lantern in order to get off a Thunder Wave. That alone isn't enough though, but it is my only shot. Goodbye, brave soldier. huge lantern from a fucking beyond the grave actually saves pangoro here i've made it out of the desert and now down to six pokemon i at least get one final encounter before i head onto the route that's surely going to end the run hoenn is littered with the bodies of my former teammates now 21 of them but i must keep 
going. The encounter is a murkrow. Any sort of type diversity whatsoever would have helped me, but instead I double up on the dark and flying type. This doesn't even evolve yet. It literally could not have been worse. But instead of just finally deleting the save file, I keep playing. Just one more fight, just one more battle. Why am I not resetting? Am I really still having fun? All the next trainers are weak to ground. With Gliscor, Camerupt, and Crocodile still in tow, these fights are actually beatable. This is the next trainer chat predicted to be the run killer. Ninja Boy Lung. Even though I can take out his lead Viper with little issue, the two remaining Pokemon are brutal. Protean Greninja is terrifying, but Excelgor, what could he do? After using Murkrow to get a sticky barb onto the itemless Greninja, I make a bold switch, bringing in Gliscor and risking death to the Water Shuriken. But I'm not playing safe anymore. I'm not gonna play around the fucking crit, because how could I? I don't have a box. I don't have the option to. I have to take these risks. Playing a strategy where I have to hit four hit rock blasts, where I only win because of an effect spore proc, where Houndoom just dies in two different battles if the enemy happens to click protect, where the run is not just a fully calculated deterministic puzzle, but where the lives of these fictional creatures I somehow care just a little bit about are in the hands of fate. And fate spares me. Greninja only hits three times allowing Gliscor to get a bulldoze off. I'm not out of it yet, because I need to make sure whatever I bring in can survive the final gambit. Final gambit is a unique attack, a fighting type move that always deals the user's current HP value to its target before causing the user to faint. It's like explosion and eruption rolled into one move. The Excelgor has 140 HP, so that is the damage it will deal if it takes out itself with final gambit. Breloom comes in, Water Shuriken leaves it at 112. HP. It's dead to final gambit, but the lives of my Pokemon are not just in the hands of fate, they're in my hands as well, and I have one more trick up my sleeve. If I mock punch the Excelgor, maybe, just maybe, Excelgor's HP will be low enough so that final gambit does not do enough damage to Breloom and save it from certain death. Get the fuck, get the fuck out of my lobby. Get the fuck out of my lobby. Somehow the next run killer falls. Camerupt shines its brightest in the next fight. A sun focused battle against rich boy Santos. He has a nine tails, a chlorophyll shift tree, an ice shard mamoswine, and a choice scarf eruption typhlosion. I have to sacrifice Murkrow in the face of Typhlosion's infernal damage, but Camerupt's improved magma armor keeps it safe from critical hits, giving me a shockingly safe matchup into this beast. Houndoom gets in, kills the Typhlosion with a sucker punch, and one-shots the Mamoswine with Flamethrower to somehow keep this run alive for just one more fight! Why do we even do Nuzlocke's at all? If you've seen my previous videos, you might have the impression that it's all about the glory of winning against all odds, of overcoming a challenge you previously thought was impossible, of putting on your cool shades and beating the Elite Four after months and months of staring at spreadsheets and calculators. But that's not what it always was about, right? Was the Nuzlocke challenge, since its inception as a webcomic, not always just a way to turn a Pokemon playthrough into a personalized story? To turn these digital beasts into characters with projected personalities whose valuable lives seem to be at stake as we lead them into battle. I'm reminded of the Greek story of Damocles I referenced earlier in the video. A story about King Dionysus who teaches his friend Damocles the burdensome and dangerous nature of being a ruler by swapping places with him for a day, but suspending a dangling sword above the throne. But this run did not make me feel like Damocles, in constant danger of impeding death. It made me feel like Dionysus, who got to experience life unburdened by the sword above his head for just one day. Since the dawn of time, humans have wanted to tell stories. I think maybe Nuzlocke's are just one of the many ways we've come up with to tell them. But the thing about stories is that not every story ends in glorious victory. Some stories are tragedies. And apparently some part of me felt like this one was worth telling.